Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, glad to see old friends. Uh, and this talk will be about uh, diffusing particles that exhibit uh, universal exponential tails based on the experiments and theory that I've done by several groups. Uh, so I want to start with uh, uh, this famous uh, scientist. Uh, this is Gauss. Uh, and this is a country, Germany, that respected scientists, at least in the past. And uh, uh, in this uh, figure of Gauss, you see the bell shape, the famous the Gaussian distribution that for Brownian particles describes spreading of particles. Um, what I'm going to claim uh, based on the, in the first part of the talk, based on work with Stas Borov in this PRL, uh, actually, well, this is a very nice note, but uh, okay, there is a slight mistake in this note, a historical mistake. Um, and this is, oh, sorry. And this is the real guy that should be on this note. Do you know who this is? The, it looks like Mozart, yes, but uh, th this guy is Laplace. And Laplace uh, invent, uh, and here my student uh, uh, Mario, uh, he plotted two fits. One is this Laplace distribution. Laplace distribution is an exponential decay on the two sides and then the Gaussian, but actually Laplace invented both of them. I'll, sh I'll explain this old history a bit later. Uh, but this talk is about the fact that uh, in many experiments, uh, packets of diffusing particles expone exhibit exponential spreading in agreement with the first law of errors, uh, which was already discovered by Laplace in 1774. I will show how this is related to large deviation theory in uh, the first part of the talk. Uh, in the second, uh, uh, and we'll show that this is a universal feature of a well-known continuous time random walk model. In the second half of the model, I'll uh, describe a many-body uh, interacting system approach to describe this type of spreading, which we call the hitchhiker. This is mainly numerical walk, and this walk was done with uh, Hidalgo Surya. So um, the, let us start with the phenomenology that is observed. Uh, there is a growing number of glassy slash biological slash source of active matter systems that exhibit normal diffusion. The packet of pa the particles all starting on a common origin, the, the variance increases linearly with time with some diffusion constant. The anomaly comes from the fact that the particle spreading is given by this law, which is this is exponential decay. And I'll soon explain exactly what I mean by this. And the, 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 the remarkable fact is that this find is found in many systems, colloidal glasses, nanoparticles in polymer solutions, molecular motion, liquid solid interface, living cells, financial markets, worms, et cetera, et cetera. So we were sitting during the pandemic and we were looking at the experimental results and many of them report these exponential tails as I'm going to show. Uh, particularly, this uh, for me at least started in nice work by Walter Cobb that uh, influenced our work a lot. I'll soon show it in 2007. Then Gra Granik uh, moved into the biological framework like diffusion of single molecules in the cell and then this field kind of uh, exploded. There are many references that and I don't, and don't want to write all of them. But again, this is based on only experimental uh, results. Um, so let us start with the phenomenology, continue with the phenomenology. So this is taken from the Walter Cobb's paper in PRL. Uh, and he looks at different particles uh, based on simulation and some also some experiments that he analyzed. And he simply he plots the probability density function of the position of the particle at some, uh, at some times, t, t is growing. And he simply plots them on a log linear scale. And what you see here, that these are more or less straight lines these are exponential decays. In many of these cases, according to this phenomenology, in the center part, you have something like a Gaussian. You see this, uh, this is the Gaussian, this is the um, parabola. And then here, straight lines, more or less. Okay, this is a real experiment. And uh, th this is a generic behavior that Cobb uh, 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 saw. And they also saw the basic mechanism and we, we follow on this. The basic mechanism th they promoted was based on the so-called continuous time random walk model. Uh, and here we have typical trajectories. These typical trajectories are seen today in tens of laboratories in single molecule experiments. And what you see in these uh, trajectories, there is a model trajectory and a Lennon-Jones type of simulation trajectory. 
you see the following. You see a particle uh, diffu uh, uh, kind of vibrating in, or, or doing a random motion in some trap. This can be an entropic trap or energy trap. And then it jumps to another location, another location, and it does such a random walk. Uh, this is a, you wait and then you jump, you wait and then you jump. This will correspond to the simple model that I'm going to describe, this continuous time random model. Another feature of these type of trajectory is that some of the particles, they don't jump at all. They, some of them don't move, some of them move a lot. The important fact here is very simple, is that you have a variability in the number of jumps. The number of jumps n, uh, here you have one, no jumps, n is equal to zero, here maybe seven jumps, uh, is going to fluctuate. And this fluctuation is going to be super important in our context, as I will explain later. And the general idea is very simple, that uh, if you have large number of jumps n, this will lead you to large displacement and convergence actually in the tails of the displacement. Another thing to notice about these experiments is that the time scale for the jumps can be of the order or less, but not so far away from the measurement time. So the time for jumps, so, so you don't see a gigantic number of jumps, that's also important. Okay, so, um, so another example uh, is uh, this uh, experiment by Granik. Uh, they have some actin network, they have a bead, uh, the size of the bead is roughly the size of the mesh, so you get stuck and then you jump, you get stuck and then you jump, etc., etc. Again, this hopping type of model. Uh, and then he sees slightly different phenomenology, which is important, and he sees the following. You, he, this is the probability of finding the particle at dxt, again, log linear scale, and you see this is exactly Laplace. This is a tent shape. This is Laplace for short times, and then again, more or less Laplace, and then for long times, you see this parabola, this is Gauss. So you have a transition from a tent, which is Laplace, to Gauss at long times. In all my models, in the very long time limit, you will converge to a Gaussian, but here you see in this experiment, this Laplace on short times, and it, the interesting part here, in my opinion, is this cusp, we saw this cusp, non-analytical behavior that they see in this experiment, and then the question is, when do you see naturally this type of non-analytical behavior? That's a different type of question you can ask here. Another example is, uh, these are uh, uh, experiments done by Yuval Garini, and we helped analyze, and these are diffusion of uh, telomeres in the nucleus of the cell, so these are endpoints of your chromosomes, and they have some active motion, direct and, direct and motion. Uh, again, if you plot the PDF of particles, you get here at the tails at least something more or less exponential, this shows that you see this phenomena in many different scales. So now let us analyze this with uh, simple models uh, just to understand why can you get these exponential tails kind of uh, very uh, naturally in my opinion. So first of all, let us go back to the problem considered by uh, many, uh, and that is the sum of IID random variables, but the number of jumps n is going to be fixed. So this is like the position of the random walker, and here I just sum up uh, uh, xi, th this, this, uh, th this uh, random variable comes from a distribution, uh, f of x, which you can consider as symmetric, so I have no drift. And then uh, if we look at the tail, that is the probability to be at x given n, uh, of course, this, first of all, let's say will converge to Gaussian, but let's look at the tail, losing large deviation, then in this crowd, I think you know all, that if I start with the Gaussian for the, the, the summons, I'll get out a Gaussian here. If I start with a power law, I'll get out a power law here. If I start with an exponential for these random variables, the tail will be uh, exponential. If I have a cutoff, like a random walk on a lattice, uh, uh, that is two delta functions describing these jumps, then I'll have a cutoff for this guy. What does it mean? You see that if n is fixed, the tail of the PDF is totally non-universal. The junk you put in is the junk you, put, you get out. Uh, there's no universality. The claim will be that under certain conditions, if you have fluctuations on this n, you do get something universal, which is this exponential decay. So what is this continuous time random walk model? It is similar to the experiments. It's a wait and then jump model. The waiting times are described by a renewal process. So you have a probability density function psi of tau describing the times between the jumps. And after the trapping event, 
uh, you make a special jump with the PDF f of x, again, a symmetric function. So in this game, we have two PDFs, and our goal is to show that under certain conditions, no matter what are these functions, you converge in some limits to these exponential decays. That is the, what we are doing. In general, this probability of being at x at time t is given by this expression. You sum over the number of jumps from zero to infinity, you have the probability of making n jumps, which is determined by this waiting time PDF, and the probability to be at x at given n, which is given by this function f of x. And now we want to see how this gives you um, these exponential tails. So what are the main results? We have only very two mild conditions, uh, which I'll quantify a little bit better later. The first thing is that the waiting time PDF has to be analytical for short time, and we'll understand why we need the short time analytics, uh, analytical behavior. For example, if you have a random walk, this psi of tau is a delta function, it's not analytical and then you don't have this case. Of course, this demand is very mild in the sense that, of course, the psi of t sh tau should be, became anal uh, uh, be analytical. The second thing is that the PDF of the jump length has to decay faster than exponential for large x. For example, it cannot be a power law, but if these two conditions hold, then the tails of p, x, and t are exponentially decaying in large x, and you have some logarithmic corrections which are important. And because of these are tails, this is related to large deviation method and Kramer's Daniel uh, theorem. Um, so how to understand this exponential tails very intuitively? Um, I will start with a simple model. Um, and that is, I assume the waiting time PDF is exponential and the jump lengths are Gaussian. So the idea is to sum with, with Gaussian jumps, but to get exponential decaying in space. So here I have the Poisson distribution that is the probability to make n jumps in time t, the time between jumps is average is uh, one, and here I have the Gaussian, the conditional probability given n jumps. Now, let us denote uh, for fixed x, but I'll take x to be large, n star, the largest uh, uh, summand here. All of them are positive. So if I take the largest guy, then obviously the probability density is going to be uh, greater than this uh, expression, which is the s w only one term of this sum. What is this uh, 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 n star? It's very easy to compute. You take this n factorial, you put it here, log n factorial. X is large, so we can use Sterling approximation, n log n, and then you find n star and it is proportional to x. n star is proportional to x, then if I have x squared and I put here n star, then it will be x squared over x, then I'll get this x and again log corrections. So I think this is the simplest explanation you can get. And if you don't uh, 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 totally agree, then you can do a, a simple uh, look at the maximum of this sum. And this is n star versus x, and you see that it goes more or less linearly. Of course, there are steps because n is is an uh, integer. And you see this linear, and what does this mean? It simply means to reach large x, you need a lot of jumps, and it's linear. And then px of t is bigger than minus x squared over 2n, and then this goes like e to the minus x if I neglect logarithmic corrections. So th th this uh, a simple model with Poisson distribution of, uh, of jump lengths just uh, starts the question, is this ge generic, or how generic this is? And the answer is it's pretty generic. Uh, so you, you can do it a little bit better uh, uh, using large deviation. It's a simple large deviation argument. So what is larger deviation? Uh, you all know, uh, mo most of you better than me even. Let us look at this probability density function, again for this model, but now in K space, in Fourier space. So here is the Gaussian, I take the Fourier transform, and here I have the Poisson statistics. Uh, the first idea, the usual idea, is to replace K with minus IU. The real reason for that, in my opinion, is that one wants to go to the forgotten guy, which is Laplace. You want to change the integration in Fourier space to Laplace integral in the real space. So the large deviation is, uh, I think, also Laplace, but never mind, this is history. Then you get, you can sum this series, you get this uh, moment generating function uh, with u, uh, and then you have the cumulant generating function, which is this log, uh, which was introduced in the previous talk. Uh, then you need to do a subtle point approximation. Uh, you need to look the maximum of this guy when x is big 
uh, you, 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 you find this, uh, you take the derivative, you get this. If you do this, you find this equation for this u hat, which enters in this large deviation calculation. The solution is given by some Lambert function, and then we get this u hat given by this Lambert function. Now, these details are not so important. Let me summarize the result. Neglecting the prefactor that can also be calculated, the px of t is given by this uh, x, x here is large, the large variable. You have the rate function i x over t, and the rate function is given by these sum of these two Lambert functions. Okay, this is detail. Now we can take the asymptotics of this. Uh, we can take uh, the small x behavior, then you get px of t, it's a Gaussian, and this is not surprising. The rate function is parabolic, close to the minimum, and here is the central limit theorem. But while we go to the opposite limit, where x is large, then we get this x log of x, which is the scaling of Laplace, uh, the linear in x. This is Laplace law. Uh, and we can do this on many other examples. Uh, and um, uh, so, 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 so what we see from this example, and soon I'll generalize it a little bit, is the following. We can do it in a perspective of history, which was already nearly 100 years ago, summarized by a statistician from uh, Harvard, Bidwell uh, Wilson. So he said the following. Uh, Laplace had two laws, two laws of errors, but errors are like the diffusing of Brownian particles. The first law is that the frequency of the error is exponential function of the numerical magnitude of the error, that's Laplace, 1774. The second law is the frequency of the error is exponential function of the square of the error, which we call normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. And then on this, Bidwell says, it is difficult historically to attribute the second law of Gauss who in spite of his well-known precocity has probably not made this discovery before the, he was two years old. Um, the quadratic uh, law, namely the Gaussian, has such a hold on statistical community to the unfortunate neglect of the first linear law. Um, so now some resurrection of this old uh, prophet, uh, pro prophecy that indeed these uh, exponential tales are some feature that are seen uh, now in the lab, and are, I think, very natural from uh, large deviation theory, they, they have an explanation. Um, so now let us go deeper uh, beyond a simple model or one single model. What is our more general claim without proving it? Let's say you have a waiting time PDF, which has this anal analytical expansion uh, around tau equals zero. Uh, then one can show that the probability to make n jumps is given by, again, this uh, r some rate function, i, t, t over n. Uh, and more explicitly, I wrote down here an example, because this example helps understanding. Let's say a is equal to zero. So this is a constant plus something linear in tau. Uh, then we define a new time scale, t star, which is c0 minus uh, over c1. This, this time scale is very important for the large scale fluctuations in x. And then QTN is given by this law, one over n factorial, and here you have e to the minus t and t to the n. Now this, up to the constants, is the same as the Poisson distribution. Uh, in the Poisson distribution, these two scales have different meaning. But why is this important is, based on my previous example, although there is some change in prefactors, essentially you see here this uh, more or less exponential decay uh, in n, which means that also for the, any, any, any function that behaves like this for large n will behave more or less like a Poisson distribution, and then you'll get this logarithmic in x behavior. So th th this is what is determining this uh, QTN, is determining this universality. Uh, we then find the Px of n, again a large deviation function, a rate function i x of n for this distribution. I'll soon explain what are the conditions. And then under these conditions, what we get is that p x of t for large x decays linearly in the exponential linear in x. There is a log correction and this beta. Now I want to discuss br briefly what is this beta. In our model, we need to describe the jump length distribution. So we use this form and beta has to be greater than one. This is a condition. If beta is less than one, then we, we, this result is not valid and these exponential tails are not uh, correct anymore. 
Uh, this is kind of expected because uh, if beta is less than one, what will happen? There will be a different principle, not the rate function, but something called the big jump principle, where in the process, one jump will dominate the whole landscape and will win. Uh, and then not the fluctuations of n will not be so important, but one jump will be important. So any beta less than one, uh, that is sub-exponential, uh, sub uh, the far tail will be non-universal, determined by this beta. For example, if you have power laws, the tails will be power laws. I mean, if the jump size is power law distributed, then of course this doesn't hold. But again, you see here some uh, uh, very general universality. So uh, in these uh, figures, I'm just showing you QTN, these more or less exponential decay with logarithmic corrections of QTN when N is large. For different types of waiting time PDFs, they don't have to be exponential, they can be anything. And this decay, this is the formula that I showed you, this rate function. Uh, N doesn't have to be very big in order to converge. This is very important for the following reason. So this is the model, simple simulations, and these are this formula that I gave you, the logarithmic decay with the log corrections. Uh, and in these simulations, the average time uh, of jumps is roughly, uh, let's say, uh, of order of the measurement time. And this is very important because in these experiments, you cannot, do, you, you cannot really go to large deviation limit of t to infinity, x to infinity, and measure anything because then what you'll see is more or less a Gaussian. So what is happening here is that you have these exponential tails. This is the theory, it works well. And if I increase the measurement time, the center part will be more and more Gaussian, of course, and these tails will be pushed more and more to the side. Uh, and then there will be, be rare events, but here you see that they are not really rare events if you work for not so long time. And if you don't care about small fluctuations between theory and experiment, that's why large deviation theory is usually said as rare events, but I think in this field, it's not, rare, not so rare events. Let's put it this way. This is why they can measure this, um, in my opinion. So um, there was a, a lot of work, as I mentioned, uh, on this, uh, and one of the works was uh, called the diffusing diffusivity, done, uh, for example, by the group of Metzler and Sokolov and Chubinsky and Slater. These were uh, descriptions based on Langevin equations where the diffusion constant was fluctuating in time. These were phenomenological descriptions, but they have some connection to what we do. In these models, you have x dot, and you see here some fluctuating in time diffusion constant. And then you need to build a theory where the steady state of the diffusion constant is, let's say, exponential. And then the px and t, at least for short times, is given by a transformation. You have a Gaussian diffusion, and the diffusion constant is random. And this, can give, this transformation can give you uh, essentially anything you want if, you, if you, you don't limit yourself, but inspired by the experiments, they put in by hand this uh, exponential decay of the diffusion constant with no real reason. We say something actually similar because you know we have probability to make n jumps and then we have a transformation of the number of jumps, but we show that this transformation of the n will be universally exponential in the large n limit, and that will give you the Laplace tails in general. So th th that is the, the idea, but you see the similarities is that you have some fluctuating field giving you this uh, exponential decay. Here it's pure, um, pure, uh, uh, um, pure Laplace, not only in the tails. Um, I don't support this because I don't support this. I don't see any reason why this should be universal. Um, but, yeah. Right. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and you get this to this cusp. But this is done naturally with no resetting. <laughs> In the experiments, at least. Yeah. I think you have exponential to Gaussian, no? Okay, we'll talk about this later. Uh, okay. B 
Yes, this is diffusing diffusivity. So, so yeah, there are many names to this. Yes. Right. Yes, but Beck, Beck called it. Su su yes, but the point is different. That, according to what I just showed you, here you need to put an exponential function based on this city of Dharma. So that's exactly my point. If you have the super statistics, you can put anything inside, you can get outside anything. The, 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 the more difficult part is to show that you get something specific, and this is what I showed with N, but, but the transformation is general. Um, so what I'm going to do in the, in the next part of uh, my talk, I'm going to introduce a, a different point of view where, uh, where this diffusion constant is, is uh, fluctuating, and it's fluctuating uh, based on the fact that molecules in experiments are changing their size along their experiment. So I'm, I'm going to uh, 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 motivate this uh, based on some experiments. These are not all the experiments that give these exponential tails. This is a second mechanism. Uh, and the idea is simple. So if you look at, the, for example, on these experiments, uh, of single molecules, what you see is the following. You have two molecules, um, these are proteins uh, along a DNA chain, but it's not so important. And th there's molecule one and molecule two, and they are diffusing, and then they uh, meet, and then they come together, they combine chemically, and this is denoted by state three. And then you can measure diffusion constant of this D uh, in these two states, and you see here they are the same because they are the same molecules. And then when they combine, diffusion constant goes down. And it's very simple, two, two guys come together and then they double their size and then the diffusion constant goes down in principle. So uh, what uh, uh, we, oh, why did that happen? Sorry, that's wrong. So if you look at the literature about these uh, exponential tails in some of the experiments, what you see is all kinds of uh, statements. For example, uh, W.E. Moner, a Nobel Prize winner, we studied most likely the mRNP, it's a type of molecule, they study comprised of conglomerates of mRNA molecules, ribosome, and other molecules. We expect a wide variety of particle sizes, uh, and this will lead to a variety of diffusion constants. Uh, and this has inspired us to look at uh, 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 this uh, type of model that I'm going to define now. So the, the hypothesis here is that the variability of the sizes of molecules is somehow responsible, at least for some of the experiments, for these exponential of tails. And there is a process which is diffusion, aggregation, and fragmentation that lead to fluctuations of n. n is going to be the number of particles on the molecule. And this is a many, many, many body effect, uh, uh, not a single particle. So what we defined is a, a, what we call the hitchhiker model. The hitchhiker is the guy that we follow in the lab, the single molecule that is followed in the lab, some flashlight. Uh, so we have an interacting diffusing model with attachment and fragmentation. We consider monomers on a one-dimensional lattice in intermediate density. Uh, the, these monomers may aggregate, forming molecules of size n. The molecules diffuse the size-dependent diffusion constant, d of n, uh, via hopping, and then they can merge, and then they can break. If they don't break, then, of course, they will just grow. Uh, it follows that n of t is fluctuating, and hence the diffusion constant is fluctuating. These are stochastic processes. Now, these type of models were considered by many people. Uh, but the, the novelty here is that we look at one of these particles and tag it and then look at how the diffusion constant moves. And most of this work we did is uh, going to be um, uh, uh, totally numerical. So uh, defining the model slightly better, uh, we have particles on a lattice. This is the guy, the green one we are tagging. So we follow it. We cannot see the other guys. Uh, th these are three particles, one, one, and then let's say they break with some, ra some rate, then okay, this green went here and the two other guys went here, then you have diffusion, and, and then let's say these two guys hopped over here. And the diffusion constant, the jumping rate, will be determined by the size of the particle. If you are bigger, you move slower. If you are smaller, you move faster. 
but exactly how this is going to be uh, actually super important. So we, we, we were interested in this uh, exponential tail, so we, we, we looked at two types of laws. One is that the diffusion constant is inversely proportional to n to some power alpha. This is a well-known model, uh, for example, Stoke-Einstein, alpha is equal to z, or alpha equals 3 over 5, four, 5 for zim, etc. It doesn't really matter what is this alpha, so you can think about it as one said. We're not going to be very precise here. But a very different model, uh, also found in many real uh, experiments, is that the diffusion constant depends exponentially on n. This is Arrhenius type of diffusion, where you have a molecule that is attached chemically, n of its monomers are attached, they need to detach, so the energy of, uh, is proportional to n, and then this is also a very common law of diffusion on the, in these uh, disordered systems. It's not, a, it's not a hydrodynamical effect, but it's well known. So uh, now, based on our results, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do this uh, uh, trick that was done before, uh, and, and that is let us assume, just uh, this is an assumption, and we'll verify it later, that the density of particles under certain conditions of parameters decays exponentially in space. If Px of t decays exponentially, this is Laplace, the diffusion is Gaussian, but the diffusion depends on the number of particles. If I have this PDF of n, this is the probability density function of the sizes, what is this PDF? So given these diffusion laws, I can guess what are these things, and for example, for the Stokes-Einstein relation, what you get that the Pn it has to be very broad, n to the minus alpha minus one, a very broad distribution. While if you have this Arrhenius type of diffusion, P of n is going to be, it's gamble, but that's kind of a coincidence, it's going to be very narrow distribution. The idea is very simple. If you have exponential sensitivity on n, then you need a very narrow distribution of P of n in order to get a big effect. On the other hand, if like in Einstein's law, the diffusion decays like one of n to the alpha, you need a wide distribution of n in order to get Laplace. So again, this is a narrow distribution, this is a wide distribution, and this is related to how the diffusion constant depends on uh, measurement time. So the first thing we did is, just by simulation, uh, we simulated the model for some parameter set, and then we saw by fitting, and it's just a fit, that the probability density function of the, the sizes of the particles follows more or less these uh, laws. I'm not going to say that this is a power law, but you see here for uh, the Zim and the Rouse model, you see a very wide distribution, as I said before, while for the Arrhenius case, the black, it's a very narrow distribution. Uh, the reason, or the intuitive reason, I don't have a good explanation for this, is that in the Arrhenius case, because you have exponential sensitivity on n and the diffusion constant, if you have two big guys, the diffusion constant is going to be so small, they are not going to move at all, and then they will not meet, and then they will break. So the, the fluctuations of the sizes here are smaller because large guys are simply so static and they cannot merge, creating bigger guys. But I don't have a, a much better explanation than that. Um, so then, Based on the fact that the distribution of n is exactly, in this sim simulation, exactly what we predicted, it's not so surprising that when we look at the simulation, then you see here for short n, for short times, we see this uh, Laplace, and of course, at very long times, it will converge to this parabola, which is the Gaussian, similar to the original uh, experiment. And all we have here is a consistency between the distribution that we observe, the distribution of sizes, and this Laplace behavior with no real theory. And this is found for both models. Um, but then, um, how much time do I have? Five more minutes, more or less, 10 minutes. So, but then we realize that we don't understand a basic thing, and that is, the basic definition of what is the diffusion constant of a single particle in this case. There is some subtlety, and this is what I want to discuss uh, now. Some effect which is because of the many body interactions similar to kind of uh, ergodicity breaking or something like that. The, the issue is how do experimentalists tag particles in these experiments? 
And we can uh, consider uh, two cases. One of them is what we call single molecule. And that is you have one uh, chromophore that is emitting light, one of the monomers, and it is found on one of these guys. And of course, this can break, so it can hope and change in time. That's fine. But another option is that uh, uh, the experimentalists will uh, color all the molecules, and all of them are emitting light. And you follow all of them. Uh, you can, of course, have something in between. But these two uh, tagging methods uh, will influence the diffusion, what the experimentalist will observe. The reason is very simple. Imagine that these guys are moving, breaking, and doing all kinds of things uh, in, 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 the, in the soup that the experimentalist is looking at. And then uh, imagine these guys as, let's say, this is, a, this is a bus, and this is a car, this is a motorcycle in a big city. This guy is moving faster, this guy is moving a little bit in between, this is a very slow guy. Now, let's say you have a bed flying over the city and it poops from above, it's more likely to fall on this guy, on the big guy. And then what will happen is that uh, with this single molecule tracking, when you, you track this molecule, it's more likely to be on the fat guys. And if it will be more on the fat guy than on the small guy, then you will, diffusion will be slower. Uh, while if you tag all of them and then average, then of course uh, you'll get a totally different result. And all this is related to the short time dynamics when you are in the Laplace regime, when, you, when this guy will move and jump between all these guys, you'll get two uh, different, uh, uh, you will converge eventually, but at least at short times when you, we say probability density function of N, you see the question is what are these guys, are, are you looking at, uh, you have a preferential to be on the, on, on, on the big guys if you have one, one at a time. So th this, this part we could quantify. Um, so, so here, um, one second, yeah. So this we could quantify for this model, assuming all the monomers comprising, comprising the polymer are equal from statistical point of view, which is an assumption which is most likely wrong in most experiments. Uh, we could do the following. What we do is we take all, uh, we have in our system different sizes of particles, so N1, N2, N3, and we just stretch them on the line. And then we take some very long distance and we drop the, our particle here. So this is from renewal theory, this is called the straddling time between two renewal events. So I treat these guys as independent, identically distributed, and then I ask myself, what is the probability to fall in this gap? here. And of course, this is bigger, this will not, if these guys are P of N, this P of Z is bigger. The Z is statistically bigger. It's like when you go to a bus station and between two bus arrivals, you will wait for the bus not half of the time between arrivals because you will usually fall in a big gap. And this is, a, this is the formula, which is a well-known formula for this uh, P of Z. You take N and you multiply by the PDF of N, and this means that you have preference to, to fall in large gaps, and you need to divide by N average, which is assumed to be finite here. Uh, so this uh, means, as I said, that in single molecule uh, tagging, the tendency is to sam sample the larger particles, and this diffusion is slowed down if com com compared to the ensemble average. The ensemble here is just when you average over all the particles uh, at the beginning, and th so th these two types of averages are not the same. Um, and we, we could uh, um, uh, show the difference. PZ, this is P of Z and this is P of N uh, for one of the models. I, I, th this is for one of the Rouse models. So you see kind of broad distribution, but you see the full tagging, the, the single molecule tagging favors the, the larger guys uh, as expected. Uh, and then you can do the transformation P of Z if I know P of N, uh, what I mean, I know P of N, I can measure P of N in the simulation and multiply it by N and put it here and then you see that the theory works well, given that, again, I cannot predict what is this PNN, but if I know this PNN, I know this, what is this P of Z. And if I know this P of Z, I know the statistics of the large guys, uh, this means that there's no real correlations because the renewal that I used means that there are no correlation between the sizes of the particles, at least in this approximation. 
this means that I can calculate uh, the diffusion constant for the full tagging, the average one, by just taking P of n and then you have D of n. Um, while in the single molecule uh, tagging, you need to multiply this P of n by n and divide by average of n. These two averages are not the same. And uh, then for the Rouse chain, then D of n is one over n, the prefactors disappear and the full tagging diffusion constant and the single molecule tagging is given by average n times one over one over n. Again, I need the distribution of n to calculate this. We know that from the measurements, and this uh, was in some experiment that we did. Um, we, we get a good agreement. The ratio was three over two, and then we could predict from one measurement the other measurement. Uh, this works pretty well, at least in some examples. Okay, so I think, um, uh, okay, so I just want to point out that, of course, we did uh, simulations, and, and again, we see this Laplace, uh, both for single molecule tracking and for this full tracking. Um, we also analyze other models that give you, instead of far tails exponential, uh, you can get the opposite. So I mentioned this was a little bit related to what I was talking before. Sometimes you get exponential tails uh, in the center Gaussian, but you can get also exponential tails and then going into Gaussian. So there is a rich phenomenology, and this is found in this model where you have particle Diffusing and then stopping, diffusing and stopping. We could show this, but I'll stop here. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>